Oh, great! The Thomas submarine wanted to get a Predator missile. That's awesome. Warpugs, today we're going to be checking out the Fat Electrician, going over the actions of Captain Ramage. Now, you're going to hear me refer to the, U the USS Parch as a boat, which it was. If you ever hear people refer to submarines as a boat, the reason we do that is because submarines are boats. Ships don't sink themselves intentionally. That's just the name of the game. If you have any other questions about that, be sure to address them to me in the comment section below. In fact, just leave a comment telling me that I'm old and crusty, and that's pretty much, uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy with that. War Pucks. This is the story about, you. It's a, it's a story about what happens when you stop paying attention to all those people that say you shouldn't do that. But, un... Like, unlike times where it ends on the greatest fails, this isn't actually is a win. The Fat Electrician is going to walk us through this. I am partially familiar with this story. Partially familiar with this story. But we're going to jump into it. War Pugs. A cat just jumped on the table. Come here, cat. Come here. Don't, don't walk across the keyboard. You'll stop. You'll mess up something. This is cat. Say hello, cat. She is a fat cat now. She is a fat cat right now. Aren't you? Hmm? Okay. I know, I know. Stop it. Stop jumping over here. I'd stop having to put you on the ground. I mean, it's a real simple it's a real simple relationship. If you jump up here, I gotta put you on the ground. Okay, headbutt my hand. It's okay. War pugs, we're gonna jump into this. Leave a like, comment, subscribe, all the other kind of stuff you haven't already. Um, fatelectrician.com get yourself some merch I just happened to wear some warrior tier stuff today but that's neither here nor there yes she does this on purpose she's been doing this all day today like legitimately since the since the day started she's been up here come here you want to sit up here and watch this with me alright fine come here we'll watch this together here, look, look up here. Look up here. No? Yes? Maybe? Hey, what's your problem? No? Okay, then don't jump up here anymore. I don't know what I was saying. Let's go. Ah, yes, that time a single U.S. submarine took on an entire 23 ship convoy by itself. Today we're talking about. Not the story I was thinking about, but continue. The USS Parchy and its commander, Lawson Red Ramage, the first submarine commander in US history to earn the Medal of Honor and survive. But first, a word from our sponsor. Can we use that sponsor money for my breast reduction? What? Uh, I... Thanks. I feel you, man. I feel you. People busting at random times on me, too. It just happens to be... So, yeah, yeah, it happens. The hospitaler and... The hospitaler and his wife should get together at least once or twice to compare notes on how best to interrupt stuff. <laughs> There's no ad this week. Moving on. Ramage was born in 1909 and graduated from the U.S. Navy... <laughs> Guys, if he's not going to add himself, I'll add him. Warpugs, check out the description down below. I got all of his sponsor list down there, including shields, including um, this... Uh, oh my god, hold on a second. One, one second. N now I have to look. Now I have to look, because God knows. I, I, anytime, I check out some, anytime I check out something, um, if they have a sponsorship, I make sure I put the information down below, because um, I want you guys to be able to get yourself something nice. All the other kind of stuff. Um, I'm in it for that. Hold on, I'll look up the last thing that I, last thing that I checked out. So I've got his uh, Warwood Tools down there. I got his Amazon uh, down there. Zach Life, Delete Me, Henson Shaving, Zydex, and um, yeah, underwear. I am actively shilling for you to get some of uh, Fat Electrician sponsored underwear. 
Like I'm actively shedding because my cat's been jumping on me all day. Oh my god, anyway, we're going all the way to go. Academy in 1931. After graduating from the Naval Academy, he would serve on destroyers as an engineering officer, a radio officer, and a navigator. Then in 1935, he decides that he wants to try out to be on a submarine. So he goes in, takes his physical, and fails immediately because his vision isn't good enough because he has an eye injury from when he wrestled in high school. The very okay. second he fails that vision test, he makes a decision. He decides that he's not going to let this stop him from serving on a submarine. In a demonstration of grit and determination, he decides that he is going to take that vision test again tomorrow. Tomorrow. And unlike this time, next time he takes this test, he's gonna fucking cheat. Because if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Damn so straight. He takes his way out. He instructs a couple of his friends to memorize a different line of the vision test. Gets that information from them later. Puts the entire thing together. Memorizes the entire vision test verbatim and shows back up the next day ready to take this test again. So he takes a vision test. Gets a hundred percent, no problem whatsoever. At this point, the optometrist, the 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 same optometrist from yesterday, is like, I know. I know what you're doing. So he goes over, changes the board, and he's like, okay, now read me that one. At this point, Ramage is like, shit. But he figures, hey, we're already here. We're going to give it a shot anyways. So he covers up his bad eye first, reads the lines the doctor tells him to read. Doctor tells him to switch eyes, and he goes and recovers his bad eye again, reads the lines the doctor tells him to read. In the back of his head, he's like, I cannot fucking believe that this just worked. And the doctor is like, oh, hey, you passed. You must have just like had a bad day yesterday or something. And he's like, yeah. Came in drunk, don't worry about it. Came in drunk, just played pinata, spun around about 50 times for a walk through the door. I'm kill. Cool. Yeah, that was it. Anyways, now he's going to submarine warfare school. So he goes off, gets trained in submarine warfare, does great, ends up getting assigned to his first submarine, the USS S-29. He works there for about eight months. Then he gets rotated over to Pearl Harbor, where he is the sound and communications officer working directly under the commander of the entire Pacific submarine fleet. And oh. that is where he is on December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor is Oof. attacked, AKA the Japanese commit the biggest cardinal sin on the planet, fucking with America's boats. Don't fuck with the boats. Don't you dare. If you put one fin on that boat, don't touch the boat. Nemo! You touch the butt. Yeah. Let's drop some lead on those motherfuckers. <laughs> Poor little guy. He's dead. Shark bait! So obviously all of America is extremely pissed off, but Ramage is exceptionally pissed because he was actually there at Pearl Harbor when it oh. happened. And here's the catch with that. Right after Pearl Harbor, over half the American surface fleet was temporarily out of commission due to all the damage, meaning that the only answer that America had at this point in time was the submarine fleet. To which Ramage is like, put me in a sub. I want to go get some revenge. So that's exactly what happens. He gets assigned to the USS Grenadier as a navigation officer. Nice. They go out and sink two Japanese ships right off the bat and Ramage is awarded a silver star for his contribution. Nice. So right off the bat, Ramage is obviously doing pretty good. At this point, they decide they're going to give him his own submarine. Do he it. He the commander of the USS Trout. Okay, now here's the thing with being a commander of a submarine during World War II. You were only allowed to go out with the same submarine and the same crew as its commander for a total of four war patrols because the leadership believed that after four war patrols, a commander would either become too reckless or too conservative and they had to rotate him out. So Ramage goes through his first three war patrols and they are just not going the way that he had hoped. It's not the heroic revenge that he was really looking for. After three war patrols, he only manages to sink three Japanese ships. And just to be clear... Yeah, but three for three ain't bad. I'm just saying, you know, my guys. But that's not for lack of trying. He goes out and finds a ton of Japanese ships and shoots an abundance of torpedoes at all of them. But every single time that he fires the American Mark 14 torpedo, it either veers off course or it hits, but then doesn't blow up. It becomes... You see, I was about to I was about to say something about that because thanks to Drakenfeld, we know about the Mark 14, 14 torpedo, about how abysmal it was. I always knew the 14 was a was a piece of garbage. I didn't know it was that much of a piece of garbage. If you guys want to know what he's talking about with the Mark 14, there is a there is a um, there is a historian named Drakenfeld. I highly recommend his Mark 14. Um, basically just documentary on why this thing was such a disaster. I was pissed off watching it. It's called Failure is Like Onions, and it's the Mark 14 documentary of YouTube. So go check it out. 
becomes very clear to Red Ramage that he, his crew, and the USS Trout are not the problem here. It is the American Mark 14 torpedo. During their second war patrol, they actually find the Japanese battleship, the Kirishima, and fire five torpedoes at it, and all five of them veer off course, miss, or are duds. Don't get me wrong, it all works out in the end because the greatest battleship commander of all time, Admiral Willis Ching Lee, ends up sinking the Kirishima with the USS Washington in the greatest battleship versus battleship conflict the world has ever seen, but Red Ramage is still absolutely furious that he didn't get that glory because he should have sank the Kirishima right then and there. So fast forward, Ramage and the USS Trout are on their third war patrol. They go to sink a Japanese cargo ship. They fire two torpedoes at it, which is absolutely enough to take out a cargo ship. Should surprise, be. surprise. One of them is a complete dud. The other one, like kind of half-ass explodes, but not really damaging the ship a little bit. And Ramage is just absolutely furious with the situation altogether. At this point, he's on his third war patrol. He's only sank two ships so far. He is absolutely sinking this cargo ship. He doesn't care what it takes. He orders his crew to surface the USS Trout. Everybody runs out on the bridge and starts opening fire on this cargo ship with 50 caliber machine guns, anti-aircraft guns, and the three inch deck gun on the submarine. This nice. Is this is not how you're supposed to conduct submarine no. warfare, but also the torpedoes are supposed to fucking explode, so whatever. So they roll up on this cargo ship on the surface, firing at it the entire time, get within like 500 yards of it, and then shoot two more torpedoes at it, blowing it up and sinking it immediately. This is basically the naval equivalent of an execution. Then huh. he finishes out the third war patrol, goes back to Pearl Harbor, in person goes to his chain of command and is like, look, these torpedoes are garbage. They do not work. We have to do something about this. And his chain of command tells him to his face, the torpedoes work. You just don't know how to aim. This is your fault, not ours. To which this is actually true. This is actually the it was less it was less the chain of commands than the Bureau of Ordnance. Because the Bureau of Ordnance was getting all these reports about the Mark 14 not working, and then they were going back and said, oh, well, it's the operator's fault. It's the people that set them up's fault. It's everybody else's fault but ours, because there's no way we would ever produce a crappy weapon point ramage basically just throws his arms up in the air because there's literally nothing he can do other than just do his job and keep failing because his chain of command refuses to listen to him so that's what he does he goes out on his fourth war patrol on his fourth war patrol he shoots 15 torpedoes all 15 of them are misses and duds. And the worst part is, remember I said earlier, you only get four war patrols as a commander before you're labeled as too conservative or too reckless. Well, because on his fourth war patrol, Ramage didn't manage to sink any Japanese ships, he is labeled as too conservative, despite the fact that he shot almost every torpedo he had and they were all just duds. I mean, Ramage literally just did a drive-by execution with a submarine on his last war patrol, yet somehow they're gonna call him too conservative, which serves to infuriate him even more because he takes it like they're basically calling him a coward. But hey, yep. there's absolutely nothing he can do about it. So he heads back over to Pearl Harbor, then they send him all the way over to Maine where he is to oversee the completion and commission of his new submarine, the Baleo class, USS Parchy. So that's exactly what he does. Goes over to Maine, watches some people finish building a submarine, goes through a couple of sea trials, passes, gets it commissioned, and now he has to sail it all the way from Maine back over to Pearl Harbor before he can get back into this fight. And by the time he gets back to Pearl Harbor and gets out on his first war patrol with the USS Parchy, it is now March 1944. Mm. Okay, real quick, I need you to understand a ton has changed between early 1942, right after Pearl Harbor, when Ramage was first commanding submarines, and now mid-1944. First off, the good news, they fixed the fucking torpedoes and those actually work now because apparently everybody else that came after Ramage had the exact same issue. Right. And the naval committees tried to fight it off saying that everybody had bad aim and eventually due to overwhelming evidence, they were forced to accept the fact that these torpedoes actually sucked and this is now a pretty much universally and historically accepted fact. So, I cannot recommend Drakenfell's uh, Mark 14 enough on this. Okay. I cannot recommend it enough. I'm actually going to send him. A, I'm actually going to send a fellow electrician a message about this so he can check this out for himself. I'm pretty sure he's going to know most of the information involved, but it was infuriating watching this. It was absolutely infuriating watching it because I'm one of those kinds of guys. There's, there's a couple things that piss me off more than anything else. And the one thing I can't stand above anything is don't try and sit there and tell me that, you know, you know what you're talking about when you really, really don't. And that's all the Bureau of Ordnance did with the Mark 14 because they were convinced they were right. That 
and it just you know, 14 is another number that pisses me off because not only you have the Mark 14 torpedo, you have the M14, which was nothing more than a overly like heavy club with which my shoulder had to bear for years, and it was a piece of crap. Anyway, moving on. Ramage was right all along about the whole torpedo thing. Now, the bad news, kind of. After the torpedoes started being way more effective, the Japanese started doing what America was doing over at the Atlantic when they were getting attacked by the German U-boats. They started having convoys of all their cargo ships that were being defended by an escort of naval ships that would fight off the submarines. And now Japan is doing that. So America copied what Germany did and they are now sending out submarines as groups in wolf packs to hunt down these convoys together. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the majority of submarine commanders are not happy about it because they liked the idea of going out there alone, being in complete control of the situation right. and having command over everything and everyone around them. And now they have two other submarines that they have to worry about. And each wolf pack has its own commander over the entire operation, Which as well sucks. as each submarine having its own commander. And the wolf pack commander is on somebody else's submarine. So one of the three subs in the wolf pack is going to have this weird power dynamic where there's like the overall mission boss there but that guy's not in control of the sub but he kind of is because he's in control of the whole operation and it just makes the whole situation awkward so rad and his new ship the uss parchi go out on patrol and they're with the uss bang and the uss tenosa and things are already <laughs> the uss bang you gotta love that cat what are you doing Cat, stop. That, that, you don't want to hit that. That's the microphone stand. Leave, no, stop it. What is it with this cat today? Get down. Shoo. Shoo. And now you walk behind the monitors. I'm putting up cardboard boxes so you can't jump up here anymore. Be looking up in their first patrol, the Wolf Pack sinks five ships and the Parchi is credited with two of them. The second war patrol, however, shit's gonna get a little bit out of hand because Red Ramage and the USS Parch draw the short straw and they have to have the Wolf Pack commander on their submarine, creating an awkward power dynamic between Lawson, Red Ramage, the commander of the USS Parch, and the commander of the Wolf Pack, Lou Parks. And they pretty much immediately get off on the wrong foot because Lou Parks shows up and is like, hey, let's call our Wolf Pack Parks as pirates because I'm Lou Parks, I'm in charge, and you guys can be my pirates it'll be great to which ramage is like i'm i'm not playing second fiddle to anybody hear me <laughs> out what if we call our wolf pack the headhunters because i'm a redhead and the other two submarines are the uss hammerhead and the uss steelhead and headhunters sounds way cooler than pirates so they're already not getting along but regardless they get underway they get the second war patrol kicked off and they're gonna go take the fight to the enemy so july 30th 1944 like eight o'clock at night the uss parchy gets a radio transmission from the uss steelhead hey i found an enormous convoy of Japanese ships, we should attack them. To which Ramage is like, absolutely, I've been looking to get into a good firefight for a while now. Let's go. And Let's he takes go. off full steam ahead straight towards that convoy. So originally the USS Parchi was like 30 miles away. They've been traveling at full speed for hours, like three hours now. They still haven't seen a single thing. Ramage wants to radio back over to the USS Steelhead, who's supposed to be tracking the convoy and be like, hey, did they change course? What's going on? We should have intercepted them by now. Lou Parks, on the other hand, is like, no, that's not the protocol. We need to maintain radio silence and just keep going potentially the wrong way until somebody else gets a hold of us. So Ramage and Lou are button heads they have a fight eventually they end up radioing over to the uss steelhead and the uss steelhead is like yeah they changed course hours ago and you guys are like way off course headed the wrong direction so now ramage is pissed off that he wasn't allowed to make that radio transmission a couple hours prior and he's like you know what i'm just gonna start giving orders and i'm gonna go over lou parks's head this is there my sub go. i'm just gonna do this so that's exactly what he does gets the new coordinates takes off towards that convoy uss parchy finally catches up now just so we're all on the same page these are diesel powered submarines over yes. world war ii they travel on the surface at night. They submerge during the day. While they're on the surface, they are significantly faster and way more maneuverable. And since this is nighttime, they are traveling on the surface. So the USS Parchy radios over to the USS Steelhead and they're like, hey, we're here. We can't really see anything. There's like no moonlight out on this particular night. It's just pitch black absolutely everywhere to which the USS Steelhead is like, okay, cool. If you're close, we're going to start our attack 
run, and then we can just figure it out from there. So the Go USS Steelhead goes to engage the convoy. Now these Baleo class submarines have 10 torpedo tubes, six in the front, four in the back. USS Steelhead approaches, fires its six front torpedo tubes, does a U-turn, fires the remaining four out the back as it's driving away, and nice. then goes, submerges, and leaves. It is a textbook submarine attack. You blow your load, and then you run, okay? You skeet and retreat, you ejaculate, and you evacuate. The USS Steelhead is out. They fire... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say where I've heard these before. I'm not going to say where I've heard these before. 10 torpedoes, all of them were hits. They sank two ships and damaged one more. And now the entire convoy is on high alert. They shoot up star clusters, flares, lighting up the entire ocean so they can see absolutely everything. And now Ramage can see them too. So Yay. Ramage is out on the bridge of his submarine with his binoculars looking as the sky lights up from all these flares that the Japanese have just shot up trying to find other ships. And if you don't know, the bridge is like literally outside. He's standing outside on top of his submarine mm -hmm. with a pair of binoculars looking at this convoy. And it is a massive convoy. It's got like six destroyers guarding like 17 cargo ships and all the destroyers are peeling out and they're coming to hunt down any other submarines that are out there. They're coming for him. At this point, Ramage are like, cool, the destroyers broke their formation, fanning out to come find him. He's going to use this opportunity to slip past them, make his way towards the cargo ships, oh. and blow those up. So, he goes into an evasive maneuver that he calls the reverse spinner. Basically, a 270 degree turn, making it appear to the destroyers as though he's running away, but he turns so tight and it's so dark out there that they lose track of him, and he actually goes right past them towards the cargo ships. Nice! Now, Ramage doesn't know this yet, but as they're performing this super tight turn evading the destroyers the entire cargo ship convoy changes their course and goes towards him as well so oh. when he comes out of this 270 degree turn he is actually in the middle of this cargo ship convoy formation he is now completely surrounded in the middle of this cargo ship formation nobody knows he's there and he is literally so close to these cargo ships that he can't fire on the majority of them because they are within like 200 yards and that's not enough time for the torpedoes to even arm so now this is just an unforeseen turn of events he's so close that he can't actually hurt those ships but the bright side he's actually kind of being protected by the cargo ships as well because now the destroyers aren't going to be able to penetrate through that formation Ooh. to come get him so it's a super awkward silent moment nobody really knows what to do and ramage is like okay fine I'm going to go forward, I'm going to do a U-turn, and then I'm going to fire at one of the ships from behind. So that's exactly what they do. They maneuver deeper into the formation, they get enough distance on one of the ships to be able to fire, fire two torpedoes, and... They fucking miss. So they are in the middle of this cargo ship formation. They have fired two torpedoes at one of the ships, but because they missed, nobody has any idea that they're there yet, still. Now, at this moment, one of the men on the bridge with Ramage points out, oh shit, there's two aircraft carriers over there, as he points to the other side of this convoy formation. Oh. And it is at this moment, Ramage has to make a decision. He can take what is- Ain't no decision. Potentially a- pretty easy win and shoot off a couple of these cargo ships that are on the fringe of this convoy formation or he can take this opportunity while nobody knows he's there penetrate deeper into this formation and potentially take out two aircraft carriers which is like the number one priority ship to take out during world war ii and he decides he's gonna go for it he maneuvers a submarine further and further into this convoy formation and as he gets closer to these aircraft carriers he figures out they're not actually aircraft carriers they're oil tankers but that is still a major objective to at this point, Frank Alcorn, the torpedo... Yeah, the main thing about the Japanese, you gotta remember, is they were really, really... They were really, really fuel-starved for a good majority of the war. I mean, they were starved for fuel. So... An oil tanker is a massively high priority target. Officer in the conning tower is like, hey, I've been keeping track of that first ship that we missed. We're perfectly lined up on the stern side. Take a shot at it with another torpedo. So you want to do it. Ramage is like, absolutely take the shot. They fire a single torpedo and score their first hit of the night. Then he turns his attention back to the tanker. They fire the four remaining torpedoes from the front at this tanker. All four hit and sink mm. the tanker immediately. At this point, all hell breaks loose as the Japanese realize that there is a submarine inside of their formation as the cargo ships begin veering off trying to make room for the destroyers and the destroyer escorts to penetrate the formation to be able to take out the USS Parchy. And you have to remember, Ramage only has three torpedoes left and they are all on his stern side, so he orders a tight U-turn as they get the ass end of the submarine lined up with that second tanker, which Let's unbeknownst go. to them at the time is actually the Oguru Maru, the flagship for the entire convoy with the convoy commander on board. Uh -oh. They get it lined up and fire their three remaining torpedoes. They have one miss and two 
hits, bringing that flagship to a limp, almost a complete stop critically damaging it and that's nice. it that's the end of it right i mean the torpedo no. tubes are empty the only thing left to do is submerge and make a clean getaway but apparently not today as the uss parchi comes under heavy machine gun fire from the escorts and the destroyers trying to defend the convoy commander ramage decides that he's going to do some gangster shit let's go everybody off the bridge including his boss lou parks just complete dad energy of go wait in the car i'll handle this as everybody on the bridge makes their way back down into the submarine ramage points out the quartermaster you you're staying with me i need somebody to be my witness basically just stand in the corner and yell world star while i do this <laughs> just commander ramage and this quartermaster on the bridge taking machine gun fire as Ramage orders his crew to refill the torpedo tubes, which I cannot stress to you enough, is absolutely unprecedented. Literally no one has ever tried this in combat in US Navy history at this point in time. And a lot of you are probably like, well, what's the big deal with reloading a torpedo tube in the middle of combat? I mean, people reload- These things are fucking huge is the deal. Load guns in the middle of combat all the time. Yeah, they reload guns. This is not the same thing, okay? These torpedoes are 20 feet long and weigh 3,000 fucking pounds, okay? This is like 10 grown men about to give themselves hernias while they're using winches and hoists and all kinds of machinery mm -hmm. and shit to load these gigantic explosive metal dicks into a tube to shoot at the enemy. This is not something that you want to be doing on the surface of the ocean, period, getting knocked around by the waves, but you especially don't want to be doing it in the middle of combat while you're getting shot at on the surface. Right. And now the crew is also trying to reload these enormous torpedoes while they're performing evasive maneuvers, but somehow they managed to get two torpedoes up in a matter of like four minutes which i cannot stress to you enough is absolutely incredible ramage he really can't these things these torpedoes he said 20 feet long three thousand pounds they're thicker than tree trunks it's huge and doing this with pulleys and like come alongs and things like that while you're getting shot at nah i'm good then immediately lines up the front of the USS Parchy with the first ship he sees, fires both torpedoes, two hits, sends it to the bottom of the ocean. Then Ramage nice. does a tight U-turn and doubles back towards the flagship, which is now basically dead in the water, waiting for his men to reload more torpedoes. As he gets closer and closer, the torpedoes still aren't up yet, and that's when he gets an idea. He pulls the submarine right up to the ass end of the Oguru Maru, basically hiding behind it from all the other gunfire because these ships don't want to fire on their own flagship. Oh my god reach out from the USS Parchi and touch this ship is how close they were. He got it so close that the guns on the Oguru Maru couldn't actually shoot at it and he's just sitting there waiting, hiding behind their own flagship. Then a couple minutes later, he gets word that there are three <laughs> torpedoes up on the stern side. He peels off in a hard right, accelerates away, lines up the ass end of the sub up with the flagship, fires three torpedoes, sending it to the bottom of the God. ocean. In all the commotion and the darkness of night, the Japanese lose track of where the USS Parchi is. And now it's just out in the middle of the formation in the darkness as spotlights are searching for it everywhere as Ramage scans around looking for his next target. And he's looking and he's looking and he's totally in in the zone trying to figure out the next most important target that they can take out while his crew is down below reloading more torpedoes. Ramage is so in his own headspace and he's the only man on the bridge besides a quartermaster that he doesn't manage to notice that there is a gunship headed straight towards him uh -oh. attempting to ram him and cut the USS Parchi in half. The quartermaster, the only other man on the bridge that could see this coming, tries to get Red's attention but he can't so he yells down into the sub that they're about to be rammed and at this point the helmsman Chet Stinton takes Matt into his own hands and he orders full speed ahead. He doesn't know what direction he needs to go, but he knows that being up to speed when he finds out is going to make all the difference. Right. Moments later, Ramage sees a gunship bearing down on them. Oh shit. And he orders full speed ahead, but his crew's already done it. And Good. now it's just a matter of waiting to see if they're going to make it as the gunship gets closer and closer as the USS Parchi desperately tries to get out of its way. As the collision course of the gunship passes the midline of the USS Parchi, oh. Commander Ramage orders a hard right, kicking the ass into the sub out of the way as the gunship and the USS Parchi drive right past each other headed opposite directions. Oh. And as they pass one another, Commander Red Ramage looks over at the control tower of the gunship and tips his cap in a complete gangster move as he makes his way towards his next <laughs> Yes, my children. This is the day you should always remember is the day that you almost... <laughs> Jack Commander Ramage... <laughs> I'd have preferred it if you flipped him off, but 
that'd be more my move than anything else. Damage regains his bearings and he is now out of the frying pan and into the fire because he is boxed in by a ship on either side and there is an enormous troop transport headed right at him and if they meet in a head-on collision, Parchi is not gonna win. So he does the only thing he can do. He slows the ship down trying to buy more time before this collision as his men frantically try to reload the torpedo tubes at the front of the USS Parchi. They get two torpedoes up moments later and he fires them immediately, which is absolutely not ideal to be firing torpedoes at the front of a ship. They could glance off the side. It's a smaller target to hit. It's mm -hmm. just ill-advised altogether, but it's the only option that they have. And as fate would have it, both torpedoes would hit bringing this enormous troop carrier to a screeching halt, dead in its tracks. This gives Ramage just enough room to shoot the gap, breaking out of the Japanese convoy nice. formation, and as they cross the midline of this troop carrier, they make another hard left, lining up the ass end of the sub up, as the crew gets one last torpedo up and ready to fire at this troop transport. <laughs> and as the USS Parchi makes its getaway, putting distance between itself and the Japanese convoy, it fires that last torpedo, sinking that Japanese troop carrier with over 5,000 troops on board, oh where over God. half of those men would be lost at sea. At this point, the USS Parchi is absolutely going to make a clean getaway, and Ramage knows that, as he looks back and watches the escorts and destroyers try to chase him down before he gets ready to go back below deck so they can submerge. One of the destroyers, using its signal light, signals to Ramage, Who are you? What's your name? To which I presume the quartermaster is like, why do they want to know your name? And Ramage is like, because their officers are going to have a lot of paperwork to do. As they go back below deck, <laughs> the USS Parchi submerges. They make their clean getaway after 34 minutes of combat where the USS Parchi fired a record-breaking 19 torpedoes and sustained nice. virtually zero damage in return. So nice. Red Ramage, the crew, and the USS Parchi all make their way back to Pearl Harbor to prematurely end their second war patrol, which they kind of had to do considering they just shot virtually all of their torpedoes. And by the time they make it back to Pearl Harbor, the entire Navy has heard this story and they're starting to call it Ramage's Rampage. And they're <laughs> actually greeted at the dock by the Rear Admiral in command of the entire Pacific Submarine Force, Rear Admiral Charles Lockwood. And nice. he credits the USS Parchi with sinking five enemy ships for a total of 34,000 tons. Now, to be perfectly intellectually honest, that is what they were originally credited with sinking. Later okay. on, a committee that was comprised 100% of people that weren't fucking there got together and they decided that they didn't think that he actually sunk that many oh, ships. Okay. Now, How many did mind, he sink? This is the same type of committee that also said that the Mark 14 torpedo was perfectly fine and everybody else just had bad aim. So this committee and in its infinite wisdom gets together and they decide that Commander Ramage, the USS Parchi, and its crew only what? managed to sink two enemy ships during their entire 34 minute battle where they shot 19 torpedoes at like point blank range, but whatever. That's what's on some of the official records, but everybody knew the real truth. And for that reason, Commander Lawson P. Red Ramage was awarded the Medal of Honor and became the first submarine commander to do so and survive. And nice. Ramage 100% credited his survival to his crew. And he thought yes. that his Medal of Honor was just as much theirs as it was his. And for that reason, he made a certificate and gave it out to every single man in his crew. And it read as follows, quote, the captain wishes to emphasize the fact that the Medal of Honor was accepted from the president of the United States as the nation's tribute to a fighting ship and her career courageous crew. He feels every officer and man whose loyal cooperation and able assistance contributed to the success of the USS Parchi has an equal share in this award, which he holds in trust for you with pride and respect. Sincerely, LP Ramage. That's in a good captain for this you. This has been the story of Ramage's rampage, an awe-inspiring tale of both leadership and teamwork, as well as- I want to play Wolves of the Pacific right now. A cautionary tale of the lengths that a single American will go to whenever somebody fucks with America's boats. Stop <laughs> touching the boats. I can give you endless amounts of examples and somebody's still going to do it. Okay, right. just don't. No touchy. No touchy. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. Oh my God. Nobody listens. I mean, in 1941, somebody touched America's boats and we invented a fucking portable star to get our revenge. <laughs> I don't even want to know what they have now. <laughs>
I want to play Worlds of the Pacific like right now. That's the that's one of the that's one of the funnest things to do when you're playing Wolves of the Pacific is just to get right inside of that convoy line and just wait. Cause there's nothing they can do about it at that point. My favorite one was Rise Sunk. I, I uh I somehow got I, I wanted to participate in the Battle of Coral Sea. And I got right at the island where the carriers are going by at midnight. And I sunk both Japanese carriers and didn't die. Now that was fun. War Pugs, I'm going to head out from here. I hope you guys have a really wonderful day. I'm going to grin for about an hour after this. That was, that is just nuts though. That is absolutely nuts. War Pugs, check the description down below for everything. Check down below for my merch. And I'll catch you guys next time.